I'm going to be taking a little break from the bear videos, mainly because um, the weather's been so terrible. It's been raining. I haven't had time to work on it at all because of the rain. I'm going to switch to posting my recent build, which is a bed. Here's the parts of a footboard and two side rails. This is the headboard. These are all freshly stained. They're going to be clear coated today. And the first video in this series is technically going to be milling up the lumber for this bed because about 50% of it is made from hardwood cherry. The other is cherry veneer. I have a piece of that cherry veneer ply um, up against my wall there as storage. And I'm going to be showing you how to use a planer and a table saw to joint lumber if you don't have a joiner, which I do not. And I'm making it a separate video so that in future videos I could just reference the video about milling lumber versus filming it over and over again every time. So the first video in this series, I guess you would say this series, is going to be making those jigs and jointing this lumber. The solid lumbers I get is from a place about a half an hour from my shop. Um, if any of you read fine woodworking, you'll have noticed they advertise in there Harn hardwoods, and the quality of lumber is really great. You can get, if you are someone who wants to make something and you don't want to make it out of construction grade lumber or cheaper lumbers, you want to make it out of hardwoods and you don't have a lot of tools, a lot of these bigger lumber yards like Harn, when you're there, if you ask them to mill up the lumber for you, they will. Of course, it's going to be an additional fee, but it's a nice option for people that don't have a ton of tools. I always opt to mill up my own lumber because number one, I'm a woodworker, and number two, I do enjoy doing it. So like I said, this is cherry, and I don't get a lot of hardwood projects a year, but as I get busier, more and more people are approaching me and want things made out of solid lumbers. So I don't have a jointer. I've been saying that since the beginning of these videos. I do have a planer, and I obviously have a table saw. So the first part of this video, which might end up being most of the video, is going to be me showing you how to make two jigs out of this, um, it's almost like a melamine particle board with um, a laminate on it. And one's going to be for the planer, and that is going to essentially turn your planer into a jointer, so I could surface joint the one side of these, and once one side gets flat, you can joint the other so then you'll have two flat faces and the other jig is designed to be put on your table saw fence and that way you could turn your table saw into an edge jointer and I could joint one edge and then use that square edge off my fence in order to joint the other to rip the other side square. Now obviously these sorts of jigs are not going to be a replacement for a jointer. A jointer is going to do the best job because that's what it's designed to do. But I think for someone like me or anyone with a small shop, um, I would want a larger size jointer in here if I was to buy one. For example, these are probably going to be wider than 6 inches, so already a 6 inch jointer would not do me a whole heck of a lot of good with this project. So this is kind of an easy way to make two simple jigs, get more bang for your buck with your tools, and be able to get more versatility out of them. So both these jigs are fairly simple. Um, if you do any research online about these jigs, there's many, 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 many designs out there. Um, in general, my go-to for making a design or picking a design to copy is just going to be the ease of making it and how well it works. But luckily enough, for especially the jig for the planer, the mechanics of it is so simple, it's kind of hard to mess up. Basically what you're doing is you're using this piece of underwood, which you can use pretty much anything, but MDF and this particle board are going to be your best choices because they're going to be the flattest. I chose to get this one with the coating on it just because I have to kind of store jigs in my shop. And they get banged up when you're moving them around, and this is just an added piece of protection. I very rarely buy prefabbed wood. These are prefabbed to fit um, as shelves in modular shelving units, but I could pretty much take this out of my car and start using it right away. I'm just going to have to cut this down to, I'm going to cut it to 12 and a half inches to fit through my 13 inch wide planer. 
So after I do that, I'm just going to add a little cleat on the back to keep this in place. And then it's simply a matter of this board here has a big bow in the middle. You're going to shim underneath so that when this goes to the planer, the planer rollers can't push this down, which is what it's going to do. You would think that you could send these through the planer and it will flatten it, but it won't. Those rollers will end up pushing this down, planing it the same thickness across, and then when it comes out the other side, it's going to spring back up with that bow, and but the top will just be a little less rough. So by adding those shims, you make it so it can't sink. It's going to take down the high spots, which are on this end and that end, and once the entire surface has shown that it's been planed, you'll know that it's ready to go. So I opted not to put any sort of cleat backer on the front or the back of this. I'm just going to give it a go. Um, I've never had a problem with pieces moving around a ton in this planer, so I'm just going to try it out. If it doesn't work, I could just add one. I did have this fairly large piece of this, that um, rubber matting a lot of people put in their toolboxes. It's a, it's a non-skid gripped mat that the wood could sit on top of. And I'm going to be obviously adding shims. And I was going to dry fit those in place, but now that I'm not putting the backer in, I do have a hot glue gun. That's actually, um, it's a construction glue gun, so the glue's a little bit nicer than the glue guns, the smaller mini ones you get at uh, Joann's. It's a little bit more durable, so I'm going to hot glue gun those shims in place because of this coating. You'll be able to pull them right off once you're done and see how that works as is as a very, very simple jig. So if I bend down here, you could see these two tables are not perfectly even, but you could see the gap in this piece, and this will be where I'm putting the shims. have everything set up, the hot glue um, on two sides, and I'm going to send it through since this one bows like this, it's high on both ends. So I made sure to measure, especially off this end that's going in first, the height so that I don't jam up my planer. And I'm just going to send each, it going to keep on sending it through until the entire top surface has been planed. You'll be, it'll be easy to tell it has been plain because this is rough sawn lumber. So as soon as that roughness is gone, you should be good to go. And I'll check the flatness and then I'll do the other three boards. I sent this through about three or four times and you could see that it's slowly taking off more and more from each end and eventually after probably five more passes I'll about reach the middle and then this side should be about done. You could see that there is some kip on either end but that would happen with regular planing of these boards. Then once that's done I'll stack it and once all the other ones are done I could surface plane the other sides to get them to the dimension. Probably not going to film doing the rest of this. I'll film it once it's done. So far I have no movement on this board and it seems to be working fine. So I finished up that piece and you can see that the bow is still on that one side because the side lifts. But if I flip this upside down now, now it sits on there perfectly flat. So those two edges are down and this is flat. It doesn't rock or anything. So now with it like this, I'll be able to send it through on the plain side, jointed side down and get rid of that bow on the top. But I'll do that when all other three pieces are done. That first piece went pretty well. And if I remember correctly, just from gauging it with my eye, that was the most um, out of whack out of all of my pieces. Full disclosure, um, when I was passing it at a point off camera, one of the edges of my carriage caught this little rim right here, yet since my piece is overhanging this carriage, 
the feeder still picked it up and was dragging it through and that popped all my hot glue joints on here. I was able to reset everything and keep on going, but I think that was enough to prove to me that I need this cleat on the front because if anything, that's what's going to happen. Your feeder will pull the piece through and your carriage will stay behind if it gets caught in there again. I won't have to worry about that because the cleat will stop the piece from moving forward. The hot glue on the shims wasn't terrible, but this time around I might try putting the shims underneath the um, mesh I have so I don't have to worry about gluing them. All in all though, except for that one little mistake, which let's be honest, I probably should have put that cleat on in the first place. It was not bad. It's not as fast as using a joiner, but if you don't have one, it's definitely a doable um, tweak. The other thing I did do, since this is so long, a lot of the videos you see, they're only doing this with like four foot wide pieces, which makes life a lot easier. It's a lot more cumbersome using these seven, uh, six, seven foot pieces, is I took my extra scrap that I'm going to be turning into my fence for my table saw jointer because at the end everything kind of wanted to tip over so I added that as well just kind of propped it up. So I have this one set up with the cleat in front and by putting that shim underneath of here on top of the uh, the padding I was able to avoid the hot glue in the front. Um, this isn't long enough to go to the back so in the back I did add some hot glue to that one. But once again, you're shimming this until it doesn't rock. It rocked a little bit in that front corner. Now it doesn't rock. I measured my height and I'm gonna do a couple test passes to get it right and then start trimming this one. This is the second one and it had a twist in it and you could see exactly how that twist went from one corner to the other corner and how with this shimmed up on the front and that top edge it's now trimming down where that twist is. So once again I'm going to keep doing this one until this whole surface is planed. Should only be a couple more passes and the chest test to see how flat it is. This is much easier to work with with that cleat in the front. So there's that second piece, that one end, there's one little rough spot still left, but these are oversized by a few inches, so I'll probably end up just trimming that anyway. If you put it on its belly, you can see now that this is, that's a shadow, that's not actually a gap. This is perfectly flat. The two pieces I'm going to plane and then I could put this away and it will be surfaced on two sides, my two side rails. Um, there. Now that I have my two faces surfaced, I could surface one edge and then use that one jointed edge to then put it against my fence and rip the other edge clean and these are just going to be cut to size so they're not going to be um, put into a tabletop or anything. Arguably I don't even really need to joint these because you could kind of see just from the way it's sitting on that tabletop they're not, um, the undulations aren't bad it's just rough sawn. Now if you were making a tabletop or something where your dimensions were super important, it's always good to work with a super square straight edge. But on a bed rail like this where these aren't mortise and tendon into the side, these are separate so you could take these two side rails off. If there's a little bit of difference in the top or the bottom of this, you're never going to notice and it's not going to affect um, the structure of the bed. But since I made the planer jig, which wasn't even really making a jig, I cut a piece of board down to size and put a cleat on it. Um, I wanted to have this jointer jig just because I work with a lot of clay materials. They're never square, so this will come in handy. The very basic principle of a jointer is you have a blade 
which I'm using this screwdriver as my blade at the same height as an outfeed table and then you have an infeed table that is going to be a little bit lower than your blade. So if you have a piece of wood with high spots, those high spots will ride on that infeed table and the blade will slowly take off those high spots and it will only take out enough to be able to then ride safely off on that outfeed table. So if you have high spots, these passes are incremental. They're not half inch passes. They're like your planer. They're going to be a sixteenth of an inch, you know, maybe an eighth of an inch, and you can incrementally take out high spots on the bottom of bo on a board until it's flat. So the main properties of that jointer is going to be an outfeed table, an infeed table, and a blade that can be set at the exact same height as your outfeed edge of your table. Depending on the distance of this from the difference of the height of this is how much wood will be removed from each pass. So if your outfeed table is set at a 16th inch higher, it, that's how much it's going to remove. You're basically just taking this principle turning it on edge and attaching it to your fence and that's how we're going to do this for the table saw. Once again for this jig I'm going to be using this prefab melamine sheet and I believe these are six feet by 15 inches wide and three quarters inch thick and that should be able to make my whole jig. You can use MDF for this as well and I saw two videos that I, I watched a bunch of videos on this um, deciding how I wanted to make my own and two I really like they're very similar one cuts a groove and a piece of wood that attaches to your fence all the way to the edge of your piece so that your piece will run on that groove and then the depth on this side is a little bit higher you line the blade up with this depth and that is your jointer. The other one's the same principle, only you cut a shallow groove or not as wide of a groove like you would for a sacrificial fence and then you add a shim on the back side of the piece and that gives you the height for how much wood comes off with each pass. They both seem to work. I don't have a ton of 16th, inch, 16th of an inch, 30 seconds of an inch, or even an eighth of an inch stock laying around. So I think I'm going to try the one where the groove goes all the way through the piece. And then the video for that one was just clamped to the fence. But what I want to do is similar to my tall fence for when I make raised panels, that's what this is, is make this little cubby that clamps over your fence and holds the whole thing in place. Now if you use a riving knife with your table saw, you usually have to chisel out a little bit of wood to allow for that riving knife to fit in that recess. As a general rule of thumb, I don't use one of these with this table saw. It's a personal preference. Um, a lot of times I have found with that knife, it's a stock one, and I think the dimensions of it are minorly off. So if you get a blade that's a little bit of a thinner kerf cut, it binds up on that knife, and it's actually way more dangerous than what the knife is supposed to be preventing. I used learned how to cut wood on an older saw um, without the knife at all. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to trim a piece off of this white stuff, probably to about four inches. I think this blade only comes up to three inches. I want it a little bit higher than that, so I'm going to trim it to four. That front piece cut, I'm now going to cut the back piece that is going to sandwich this in place, and from the tabletop to the top of my fence is two and a half inches so I'm going to cut a two and a half inch piece. With those two pieces in place I'm then going to want a piece of four and three quarter inches to bridge that gap. That's what those three pieces look like sandwiched around my fence. I put a pipe clamp here just to hold everything in place and I only clamp these two pieces together. This one's free of floating. If you try and clamp through this one to this one, sometimes we'll pull this over. So before I did this, I went and I ran a pencil along this top part 
and then flipped it to the outside. So I know when I go down and countersink my holes, as long as I get underneath this line, I should be okay all the way down. I'm also keeping this at its six foot length. Um, it probably doesn't need to be that long, but I'm just gonna make it six foot. And I have two other jigs that employ this kind of sandwiched fence mechanism. So I could just cut, trim it down if I need to and use that for something else. So ideally you would be able to glue this, but one of the downsides of having this laminate is you'd have to use like an epoxy or something for it to stick plastic epoxy and I'm just not going to put that on there. So for now I'm just going to put a row of screws into here. You have to countersink them so that your um, hardware won't ever get hit by your blade. And then once that's done I'll put another row of screws in the back side and then this will all be connected. Last thing, while you're screwing this together I have two squares. I'll be keeping them on my table. You want this face to be perfectly square to your table face. Um, if this isn't square to your table face, kind of defeats the purpose of this jig, you'll end up with weird lumber coming out the other end. So I put a handful of countersunk screws and through the front those were an inch and five eighths and then I just went through and did the same thing to the back. I didn't put a ton in there and now this doesn't rock back and forth but it because of the plastic on there it slides nicely on top of my fence. What I'm gonna do now is line up this edge right with the edge of my blade so it cuts right to the edge and I'm going to lower the blade and slowly raise it up and when I get it to my height, which isn't going to be three inches, it's going to be like more like two and three quarters because of the screws in here, then I'm going to slide this whole thing through until I get that cut in there. Now, if I ever want thick lumber, I could double up this back side and move these screws up, but for now, I usually don't make a ton of stuff with thick lumber. If I'm going to be using thick lumber, since it's harder to find nowadays, I'll laminate stuff. So I think for almost all the jobs I'm going to be doing, the two and three quarter inches should be fine. I have my fence set, so this is going to cut right the blade. It's sitting right on top of that blade. I also put a feather board in there, but with this cradle on top, the nice thing about making this cradle on top of the fence first is you could slide this through. It's not going to move and it's probably one of the safer ways to do this. I made a rough mark of about how high I want that blade to go. So I'm gonna turn my saw and slowly raise that blade. When it gets about to that mark, I'm gonna push this whole thing through. You could see that if you have a riving knife in here, you might have to carve out a little bit. I guess you could always push this forward, but then you're going to have some of your exposed fence. So what you could do is pull this forward and start it a little further back if you have a riving knife in here. But now from the top side, you could see that this blade is flush with here, just like on a jointer. So your outfeed and your blade are the same height. And the thickness of your blade, which is on this blade, is an eighth of an inch, is going to um, kind of represent that infeed table. So you should be able to ride this through and trim off pieces. I'm going to try and find a piece of wood that isn't my finished product just to kind of test this out first. And then I could send all these pieces through. So since cleaning out my shop, I got rid of a lot of my smaller pieces of scrap either with the bear or there was some stuff that just wasn't usable for anything that I threw out. So I don't have a lot of scrap to test out my jig. So I did take one of these cutoffs from the piece of cherry I have and I sent it through on one side. And with one pass it actually turned out pretty good. You can see this side it rocks a little bit, the side I didn't do, and there's a gap. The side I did do doesn't rock and is perfectly flat.
So I think I'm just going to send my three sides through because that thicker piece I think is already okay. It was done at the shop. Um, one thing that I will say is the reason that I used the planar jointer first is because since this lumber has bows and twists and cups in it, it's going to be safer to send through the table saw if these two surfaces are flat versus if they were rocking. So I did that first and then just the one side I'm going to do now. So that took down pretty much everything on that first pass. There was one extreme low spot right in the front that it missed. So I'll send it through again and then this side should be good. So ideally on this jig you would set up a feather board past your blade to keep this all um, pushed against that fence. But on these wider boards I have, it's just too close to my groove for my feather board to use one. But I just wanted to point out that with smaller stock, you should be mounting something here to keep that against the fence. So I now have this surfaced on three faces, so I could use this straight edge to rip this edge clean. You could see using a square just how well both those jigs work. <laughs> 